and I want to introduce Hugh Rollo from Locality. Uh, we're very pleased indeed to have Hugh here. He is um, something of a guru on the subject of community shares. So um, he, it's uh, great that we've got him here to give us an introduction to what they're all about. Then we're going to hear, as I mentioned earlier, a case study of a particular example. Do I? I need this, do I? Uh, thanks, Roz. Um, it feels a bit weird starting with community shares, sort of first thing, cold, straight into finance, but here we go. Um, I think it's because um, I live in Bradford. Um, I have a dark past in the city of London. Um, uh, I've been saying this for years, and people didn't get it for a while, but I think everyone now gets what I mean by that. Um, 25 years ago, I followed my wife up to um, the inner city in Bradford, and I've been trying to sort of reinvent myself as a good banker ever since. Um, I helped set up something called Key Fund that's based in Sheffield that invests in social enterprises across the north of England now. Um, we're investing about half a million pounds a month of loan finance into very risky start-up and early growth social enterprise ventures. I've also been involved with the larger um, national adventure capital fund, the social investment business, that has a number of loan and grant funds available. And I sit on the board for Locality. Well, I keep on remembering. I work for Locality. Um, locality is the national network of community enterprises, has 500 members across England, and essentially is founded on the basis that if you rely on other people to help you or grant funding, you'll always be short of money and waiting for other people. So get your hands on land and buildings, get enterprise, and seize locally um, the initiative um, in your own place. Um, in Bradford, where I've, I've never lived as long um, uh, anywhere else. Um, obviously, I'm not from Bradford, but um, I can say Bradford now with the best of them. I've been there for 25 years. I have been involved. I do try and get my own hands dirty and, and not just talk about this stuff. So I've been involved with the regeneration of Manning and Mills in Bradford and also what is now Carlisle Business Centre, which was another historic mill. And we've preserved the uh, historic frontage of that mill. Um, so, broadly, um, as I say, I've been trying to reinvent myself and I've done an awful lot of work with lending money to organizations. But fundamentally, I believe that debt finance has its limitations. It is very mechanistic. You agree a price and a repayment schedule and the real world doesn't often conform to that. And so about six, seven years ago now, I started to turn my mind to how could we get genuine risk money, equity capital, share capital, into social enterprise, into community enterprise. And to, um, to my delight, I discovered um, what was called um, a very ancient uh, legal form, an industrial and provident society for the benefit of the community. Um, there's been some uh, um, tidying up legislation, and we're now allowed to call them community benefit societies. Um, they're an old form of cooperative. Um, they're based on one member, one vote. So however many shares people own in them, um, uh, as long as you're a member, they're a very democratic organization. The great joy of this legal form is that they are able to raise money from the general public in share capital without having to conform with the very heavy regulation, the Financial Market Services Act 2000 and 2006, which makes it very expensive to raise money from the general public. The dispensation is given on the basis that you're raising money for social purpose. The shares that these societies issue are not transferable. So they're not like commercial shares where you 
expect to sell them on to somebody else. The only way you can get your money back is if the society agrees to withdraw those shares. So essentially, you sell your shares back to the company. Um, and as I say, I discovered this form, a uh, uh, legal form, about seven years ago um, through meeting uh, a wonderful man called Chris Hill, who I'll talk a bit more about. Unfortunately, Chris can't be with us today, but he's been a leading pioneer of this. And I commissioned him to write a short pamphlet um, a, a, about how to use this form, um, and he's become a serial user of community shares. Um, I just want to talk a little bit then about the evolution of the market since then. This is a form that increasingly people have understood, and we've managed to create a community shares unit. It's in cooperation with Cooperatives UK. It's based in Manchester, in their wonderful Art Deco headquarters in Manchester. And we have the backing of um, the Department of Communities and Local Government to do market development work around community shares. And um, it's been reasonably successful. Um, last year, we saw 161 community benefit societies, that is, this specific type of co-op who intend to offer share issues, um, registering. The registering body is the Financial Conduct Authority, the FCA, um, and they registered 160. We saw 59 share offers launched and 45 completed. Um, some share offers straddled the year end. This is the year end to December. And some are what's called open offers. So some very established societies have open offers so that they can attract new members. And then if other members want to leave, they can replace the capital in that way. I think of organizations like the Phone Co-op who provide telephony services, um, have a huge membership nationally, and they have about 500 new members, and they have about 500 members leaving every year. Um, there was one share off of failure last year, um, bad business plan. Um, we're beginning, I mean, it's not yet casino-style city sums, but nonetheless, we're beginning to raise reasonably substantial amounts of money out of this program. So um, 12 million pounds raised last year um, and still some open offers targeting further money. It's been used across a number of different sectors. Can you see that or is it all just too small? I'm sorry, um, it, it, it's, it, it, it's too small. Um, but essentially, there have been a lot of share offers around renewable energy, community-owned renewable energy, um, uh, uh, solar panels, wind farms, mini hydro programs. There have been increasing numbers of uh, community share issues by communities often wanting to save the last pub in the village. The pub hasn't been viable as a commercial enterprise, but when the village buys into it, takes ownership of it, and is a baked-in customer base, why wouldn't you go and drink in a pub that you own? Um, these pubs are proving viable. And we're seeing after a trickle, there were a few pioneers, and not far from here, the George in Hudswell, up outside Richmond. Um, the real pioneer was over in the Lake District, um, uh, what was it called? In Heskett Newmarket. Uh, the name of the pubs just escaped me. We've now seen a flurry of pubs, and um, uh, we're up to about 30 community-owned pubs these days. Some of them heritage buildings in, the, in their own right. We've seen an awful lot of community shops and, and retail being taken on by the local community. Again, often in rural areas, the last shop in the village um, and local people have come together. In a way, it's just like a collective buying scheme. Um, but again, that combination of ownership, of volunteer time, and a baked-in customer base has made shops viable in a way that um, the commercial market's not seen. And we're beginning to see 
this other sectors, a trickle of um, use of community shares in, in relation to regeneration schemes. And Emma's going to talk to you about one in Sheffield, the Portland Works. I'll just run through a few others and a few features around those. So, um, sorry, this is just to show you, this is a sort of market update. Um, last year wasn't a flash in the pan. Um, these are the new ones that have come on board um, since uh, the beginning of this year. So the trend is continuing. Um, this is particularly uh, good form. I should perhaps say something about um, the reason why I believe that share capital is so important. Share capital is patient capital. The return on share capital um, is assessed by the society after the end of the year. Technically, it's an interest payment, but nonetheless, it's an interest payment not agreed in advance with a bank. You'll pay us 3.5% over base or 7% fixed on such and such a day. But when you've assessed your trading performance at the end of the year, you then decide whether or not you can afford to pay interest to shareholders. Because you're inviting people to invest for social purpose, usually people are, you're aligning money that is sympathetic to your goals in terms of whatever you want to do, whether it's the pub or the shop or the heritage regeneration scheme. So those investors tend to be more patient. They tend to accept the fact that it may take two or three years before your business plan comes to fruition and therefore before you're able to pay um, any interest on their shares. And indeed before you'll even consider um, allowing anybody to take their money out of the operation. And as I say, and you've seen from the figures, there are quite a lot of folk who seem prepared to accept that investment proposition. And it is a genuine investment proposition. It is different um, to asking people to give money, um, you're actually asking them to invest money. The other thing that applies to many of these share offers, although we do need to be a bit careful around property deals, is that there is an uh, important tax relief called the Enterprise Investment Scheme that allows investors who are investing in new trading businesses including community benefit societies, to have a 30% tax relief. So 30% of any money that people invest in a community share scheme, they can reclaim if they're taxpayers um, from the taxman against their tax bill. And that includes people who pay um, tax through uh, PAYE. It's not just for high net worth individuals. And in fact, a colleague of mine on Twitter yesterday or the day before said that now 35% of um, the people using uh, Enterprise Investment Scheme under uh, £50,000, we think are now linked to community share schemes. So this is obviously attractive for some kind of investors. So even if you're only offering to pay modest interest rates, there is a substantial potential tax benefit um, for uh, investors in community shares, and we think that that is driving some of the market. Um, how, how am I doing? Okay. So, um, just to talk about a few schemes, just to try and bring it alive. Um, again, not a great picture, but this is a picture of... Um, Unity Hall in Wakefield. It's just, if people know Wakefield, it's just opposite the station, Westgate Station there. Um, uh, like many, uh, it sounds as if, uh, this is a very ancient form. Many of these buildings, in fact, were built by subscription, by patient local capital investing in their own place. Um, 
uh, Unity Hall was a, uh, a music venue and a public meeting hall um, and has been taken on uh, by Chris Hill who has a current community share offer. They've, their target is £200,000. They have over 300 investors and, um, uh, so far. And I, when I looked yesterday on the website, I think they're at about 155,000. So they're doing quite well to get their target. The other thing that I think is important to say about share capital is it gives reassurance to other investors. It, it helps your balance sheet. So if you want to borrow money, if I'm a lender, if I can see that you've got the first £200,000 on your balance sheet, um, the return on which and the withdrawal of which is subject to your performance, then as a lender, I'm more relaxed in lending into your organization. But I think more importantly than that, if you're also looking for grant funding, and I don't think in general that social enterprises can stand huge amounts of loan finance. So we're usually, I think almost always, talking about a cocktail of funding, and you're looking to grant finance to do the heavy lifting. If you want to tick boxes for HLF or big lottery or the Arts Council Fund to say, yes, we genuinely have local backing for that, for this project. What better way of demonstrating it than the fact that local people have voted with their wallets and produced risk capital in order to do that? So I think that the value of community shares, and Unity Hall is a, oh God, I make up figures all the time. I think it's a £2.2 million project altogether, a major refurbishment. So £200,000, you might say, not very big in the scheme of things. But actually, it's been a huge lever to align government money from Wakefield Council using various government parts and European money. It's been a huge lever in terms of attracting HLF funding. Um, and it was reassuring, I should declare my interest, to key fund as an early stage risk lender to know that there was going to be some of this patient, committed risk capital provided by local people in the mix here. So Unity Hall, one of Chris Hill's schemes, uh, he's also been involved in the uh, regeneration of a primary school in Headingley known as Hart. Um, again with a community share scheme. And he cut his teeth, in fact, on a community retail scheme in Headingley where the natural food store was, um, the owner of it wanted to retire. And essentially, Chris and others organized its customer base to buy the shop so that they continue to have access to their mung beans in Headingley or whatever it was they wanted to continue to have access to. Um, Chris is now on to his next project, which is in Sheffield, in partnership with the Sheffield Burgess Trust, and they're looking at taking um, on uh, um, a, a row of terraced houses near the university to turn into a, um, uh, um, a creative managed workspace. And again, um, that, one, that project's called Rocco, and Rocco is just about to launch another community share issue. So um, Chris Hill is a serial social entrepreneur, he's a serial regenerator, but he's also a serial user of community shares. I guess the big story nationally this year um, has been the success of Hastings Pier. Um, I, I don't know if people have followed the story of Hastings Pier. Um, Hastings Pier was in private ownership, um, ultimately held by some Panamanian uh, registered companies, by two business people who disappeared off the face of the earth, owing large amounts of money to NatWest Bank. Um, and um, 
uh, not complying with any of the environment agency's health and safety conditions on the pier. It languished um, uh, unloved and uh, slowly falling apart. Hastings is in the south of England, but Hastings isn't a rich place. There's a fairly little borough council, and the borough council weren't prepared to take on the risk to compulsorily purchase Hastings Pier. A number of people came together and said, the regeneration of our town actually depends on the regeneration of the pier. It is such a visible symbol of our decline when it's not. We can't do anything else until there's such obvious thing, a bit like Manningham Mills in a way in the center of Manningham in Bradford, while that huge mill was derelict, there was no hope for the rest of the neighborhood. So it was a key asset and perceived as such by the town. Long campaign, big Facebook group, successful bid, I think of 12 point something million to the Heritage Lottery Fund. And to complete the funding package, because they were absolutely determined that it should be the people's peer. Uh, they launched a share offer last September. They used a crowdfunding platform established by the community shares unit called Microgenius. And I want to come back to that. Um, the offer originally was going to run till December. OK. And um, uh, then they extended it to the end of March. Their target was half a million pounds. They've raised um, 560 million pounds by the end of March. Because they use the Microgenius platform, we have masses of statistics and we can track the progress of share offers. And essentially it was a bowl, a big rush of people investing at the beginning, and then it went quite quiet, and then they got on the TV and there were little spikes and then a huge rush towards the end. And I think that that's a classic investment pattern that we see in share offers. So initial enthusiasm taking people to maybe 15, 20%, then a lot of hard graft, and then a big flourish at the end. It's a pattern we've seen with share issues. And we have a relationship with Manchester Business School now. We've got a researcher, and we've crunched all the numbers in detail so we're beginning to understand quite a lot about investor motivation um, that obviously uh, through the community shares unit we're willing to share with other people. So Hastings Pier, fantastic story. They managed to get some loans that people said, well, we'll turn them into grants if you can raise so much share capital. So this was a big lever in a variety of different ways. Um, and Hastings Pier are now in construction, um, and that project goes forward, I think, with the target opening of uh, next summer. Jess Steele, who's been hugely involved in that, will be around later. She's the great expert on Hastings Pier. Uh, just one more that's very close to my heart, and our uh, colleagues from Bradford, one have come over from Bradford to me. Um, the Odeon site in the center of Bradford, derelict many years, brought up by the Regional Development Agency in order to knock it down and stick up yet another concrete and glass um, monstrosity in the centre of Bradford. The demise of Yorkshire Forward went back to central government, been locked in central government. Finally, central government agreed to sell it to Bradford Council for a pound um, with an endowment of £1.3 million to do structural works last November. And Bradford Council are now running a uh, competition for preferred developer status. And Bradford One is a community benefit society. So Bradford One is Bradford People's Bid um, to take on the redevelopment of this key site in the center of Bradford. And we heard this week that we've got £100,000 to do some development work towards getting to the next hurdle at the end of May in that competition. Um, envisaged in the long-term plans for Bradford One is that there will be a community share issue so that already I think we're nearly 500 members. Those members can, if they want to, invest in that. And we think that that's going to be an important lever 
in terms of the access to the grant funding, that's the only way that this is going to stack up. Poor old Bradford needs subsidy um, into these commercial developments, even in key sites like the city centre. Um, and so the plan is to use community shares as a lever for that. I think that's my last one. Yeah, it is. So, um, very quick uh, tour of the social investment community shares market, but I would commend it all to you. Um, I think the important thing is it is engaged risk money that provides a big lever to encourage other people to back your projects. Thanks. Can I now ask um, Emma Green, who is from Portland Works, which uh, is a, an amazing collection of small businesses based in Sheffield. I had the pleasure of going around there a little while ago. Um, Emma's going to tell us about her experience working in the community shares area. Hello, everybody. I'm from Sheffield, although I don't sound like it. <laughs> Similar to Hugh, um, I'm from down south, so bear with the accent as well. Um, okay, Portland Works. Um, uh, I've been an advisor with Portland Works um, since 2011. Um, I'm not actually part of the committee, um, but I sit on what they call the Finance and Governance Subcommittee, um, helping them out. I'm actually a qualified accountant and um, uh, I've been working with charity, in the charity sector um, for about uh, nearly 20 years now. Um, and for my sins, I've just done a master's and, um, in cooperative um, and social enterprise management and just got that out of the way. But I focused particularly on the cooperative sector um, throughout my studies and I'm really really interested in um, local projects and getting um, local community projects off the ground so that's a bit about me um, Portland Works um, uh, built in 1877 so well old um, it's um, originally one of these uh, cutlery manufacturing centers. Um, they were designed um, pre the Fordist idea of having one big factory. You used to have what um, we call in Sheffield little mesters. So you had lots and lots of very small businesses um, that were around the town that actually came together to actually do the work in one building. So each um, part of this building is split up into smaller workshops. Um, that's how it was designed originally to work um, and it's actually still working in that way. It's never stopped being um, a little mesters. Um, it's uh, part of the um, history of uh, cutlery. The stainless steel was actually first developed and made actually produced inside this building and that's our heritage. So um, it was originally called Rusnor Stain um, and they came up with a slightly better name after that. So, oh yes, 100 years. Sheffield is actually celebrating the 100 year anniversary as we speak. Um, and just as a bit of history, um, there were Buffer Girls um, this is a photo from actually inside the building of the buffer girls actually um, uh, buffing the cutlery. Okay, so it's actually got grade two star listed um, status, 29,000 feet of workshop. It has been in continuous use. It's never stopped being um, a, full of small businesses. And we're surrounded by lots of other um, similar organizations with lots of small um, businesses in them. Um, ours, um, although it was originally metal trades, there are quite a lot of metal trades still in there, but there's actually quite a lot of artists and musicians now. Um, 
uh, one thing we, we say about it is actually one of these places where you can make noise, you can make dirt, and it can be smelly. You know, it, it's, it's that kind of place, and we are deliberately keeping it like that. We are not turning it, turning it into one of these high-spec steel and glass buildings. We're keeping it as um, basic for businesses, start-up businesses in the metal trades and artists. Um, um, so the campaign, it started in 2009. Um, the building was actually owned by a private um, company, local person. Um, he'd actually bought it not long, a couple of years before, um, with the intention of converting it into flats for students, because that's what happens in Sheffield. Everything gets converted for students. Um, but uh, the people, the, there was actually a couple of tenants inside the building that actually wanted to keep the building. They'd been there, um, one's been there for about 30 years, making knives. Um, they didn't want to lose their um, very low-cost working space. So they went to the local community forum and gathered some local supporters together, and that's how the campaign got started, to prevent the planning application. Um, and they decided at that point, they went through, they got somebody involved from the university that helped them organise um, meetings and some advisors to come in and they chose the Community Benefit Society deliberately so that they could raise money from the community. Okay, so some, um, this campaign got started and um, uh, several of the people that got involved in the um, organisation were actually architects and designers, um, people within the planning um, department as well. But what they realised was people needed to understand. So I'd walked past this building hundreds of times and didn't realise the significance of it and what was in behind the wall. Um, this, the photos brought it to life. Um, and what people did was actually they, they started the social media campaign. So a, um, a website was set up and a Facebook page was set up and the campaign got started that way. Um, we also held open days. So um, all of these uh, small workshops, these are all um, sole trader or partnership businesses in this centre. Um, and these guys who'd never had anybody walk into their workshop suddenly became presenters of their work to um, lots of local people who came along to learn about these um, practical physical trades and to learn exactly how they were originally um, doing their design work. We also held open days. Um, we had the musicians come out and play in the yard as well, the yard is very useful for having, um, bringing people in, public activities. Um, on a normal day, we can't allow the public in. We don't have licenses to do that. Um, and through the, um, all this campaign, we actually probably generated, I think, about 1,000 people on the Facebook page. Um, I believe that people in Sheffield really care about their heritage and they really got behind this. But also the people that actually got quite involved with the campaign were like really working their own personal networks, pushing out the information. And so we de defeated. Ray, now what do we do? Okay, so now we've got to raise this money to actually try and buy it from the, this private owner. Now this was a guy, local businessman, I think a motor trader, I don't know why he was trying to get into property. Um, but yeah, we had to raise a hell of a lot of money. At, to start with, he was putting his price very high because he, he'd spent a lot of money buying this property. He wanted it back again. He owed it to the bank, so we had to raise a lot of money. Um, in the end, we went for a target of 200,000 and we did manage to raise that. Um, but you'll see from the dates that it actually took us a year to get through. We did actually extend the time frame of the share offer. 
Um, and similar to what um, Hugh explained, we had a rush at the start of people who were already um, heavy supporters of the project. Um, we then had a lull. We were trying to get TV in and all sorts of press. We, we worked very hard on doing that. Um, and then right at the end, in the, the 11th hour, a lot of extra money came in. Um, we did, in the end, get some press uh, publicity on TV, and I think you might recognise John Craven. This was one of those specialist programmes where they were touring around the country, and they pick on particular um, sites of interest that they want to go and see. Because you've got some um, guy like John Craven, you know, the, news, the local newspapers then pick it up and everything else. And you, if you're on the ball, you need to capitalise with that. Um, we did have a tricky last minute um, set of problems with the property deal. Um, the guy, as I said, he, he did actually want quite a lot of money out of us. Um, we'd agreed um, about six months before we actually bought the place that um, we'd do a deal with him where we'd part pay him and then we'd um, we'd have an earn-out session, so we had to pay some big chunks of money over a whole year. This was going to be very tricky for us. It made the cash flow a bit easier, but it was still, you know, it was a bit of a nightmare for us to actually manage that cash flow. Um, but in the end, it got to be complicated with the um, security on the building because he was demanding security. So were the um, we got architectural. Um, heritage money as well um, and there was complications between the um, lots and lots of legal problems that we had to spend lots of legal fees on in trying to sort that out um, in the end he got fed up and so did we um, so we managed to persuade him to um, we could buy the building up front for um, a slightly lower fee um, if we could raise the money in a very short period of time. We had a month to raise, um, <clears throat> I think it was another £50,000. Um, <clears> the way we did this, we went out to our existing shareholders. We very carefully explained our position. We explained um, uh, all the um, financial arrangements in as much detail as we could. And several people came up with the money. We made the money in the end. And it was kind of a bit of a, phew, we've got it. We've got a deal. But it really was an 11th hour um, proposition. <clears throat> so um, the vis vision for the actual project itself, it's much wider than, it's not just the heritage of the building. We want to keep it as this working building that um, people will be there, um, they'll start up in business. It's low cost, it's not this high spec place, so you're not paying high rents compared to everybody else. Um, <clears throat> but um, what I think is, um, Sheffield's very into democracy, yeah? So um, everybody likes the, likes the idea of being an owner of this, uh, community owner of this building. Um, and I believe that that's what brought a lot of people in. That they weren't just donating some money, they were actually going to be involved. And we've actually got quite a lot of people that they don't just, um, it's not just their money they're giving us, they're giving us some volunteer time um, and kind of pro bono work in all sorts of different ways that might not be on a regular basis, but, you know, they will, if we've got messages to put out, they'll put out the messages, you know, they're really good advocates and supporters of the project. Um, we're keeping it as affordable workshops and studios. We are really focusing on craftspeople, and this is like handwork crafts. We really want those people and encouraging those. We actually have a long list of people who want to get places in the building but at the moment we've um, got um, some space that um, we're refurbishing to a low spec but uh, basically we've got volunteers coming out 
coming in and stripping out some of the old um, <clears throat> where it's not been looked after very well. There's a lot of buddlier in the walls and this kind of stuff. Lots of cleaning out that needs doing. We get put in some new spaces um, uh, available for, um, we're breaking down some bigger spaces into smaller workshops so that we can rent it out and maybe earn a slightly higher rent. But we've been very, very focused on making sure that the rent covers the costs, basic costs of the building. Okay. Um, so this is um, our um, overall vision. So it covers small business, it covers cultural and heritage, and it covers education. We've got a high involvement in the, with the universities. So we've got a lot of students coming along um, from the uh, Department of Sustainable Architecture and doing all of their projects there, which gives us a lot of kudos. Um, so our society, it is asset locked, and you'll, I'm sure you'll learn about that when you set up your society. Um, we have a withdrawable capital of maximum of 20,000, one member, one vote. Um, we got 500 shareholders together, and we're offering, um, we expect to pay 3%, but that's not for the first couple of years. Um, we have a bridging loan from Architectural Heritage Fund, which we have to pay back next uh, end of next year. Um, uh, but they're doing it on a very um, good cash flow terms for us. We also raised some more money in loan stock. This we raised directly from our shareholders. Now, because they're already, they care about the project, um, they were willing to give some extra cash but for, um, we, off, we actually offer between 0 and 5%, um, between 3 and 5 years, and they ticked the one that they wanted. So it's actually come out as an average of about th just over 3% that we're paying out. And those will be refunded by mortgage that we're negotiating at the moment. So we've got a variety of things going on. It's not just the rental income. We're setting up a repair cafe to introduce people back to making things again with their hands rather than reading about them. Um, we, have, we hold regular open days for people to come in. Um, uh, there's a biography of Mosley who, and Harry Brearley who actually designed the stainless steel. So there's a lot of projects going on. Um, uh, there's a Portland Works knife has been made for in commemoration of 100 years. Um, I believe it's all about the strong bonds with the community. Sheffield cares about its heritage, and those people really care about the fact that there's some their own project going on. Um, but we've really focused on it being a viable income stream. Um, that's a picture of the knives that um, we did for the um, uh, 100th anniversary. We offered them first to the shareholders, and of course they got snapped up. Um, they're all, they, it was made, both the knife and the box were made within the boundaries of, the, of Portland Works. Um, they're numbered 1 to 100, um, and... Uh, they have a logo on commemorating for the 100 years. And again, this has raised money from us. So any opportunity, we, are, we look for opportunities that work both for our tenants and for um, uh, some money-raising opportunities because that's what we need to do. We've got a lot of refurbishment to do. Um, that's... just going to do a quick Q&A now. So um, if people have questions that they would like to ask, Hugh has joined us again. So for either Hugh or Emma, then could you put your hand up, please? And I'll bring the microphone over so that you can uh, be heard. Hello, this is for Hugh, I think. Um, my name is Carol. I'm from Stanley Halls, a similar project to this in Croydon. Um, is it feasible 
to have a Comben as a um, as a trading arm of a charity? No. That's what I thought. Um, it, it isn't, and um, certainly within the community shares unit, we're trying to promote very simple structures. What is possible, and Hastings Peer Charity again pioneered this, it is possible to convert whatever legal form you're now in into a community benefit society. It gets a bit technical. Community benefit societies are exempt charities, so they are charities, but they're not regulated by the Charity Commission. Um, the Charity Commission has plans to um, uh, develop regulators for all the categories of exempt charities, but with all the cuts and that kind of thing, that's been kicked into the long grass. But essentially, the message I want to give you is it is possible to convert from a company limited by guarantee, a community interest company, into a community benefit society. Community benefit society has to be the top company. The only other way of doing it is one community benefit society can own another community benefit society. Community benefit societies themselves can have trading subsidiaries, but again, from a transparency point of view, we're discouraging people to create trading subsidiaries. So some people say, well, we've already got a um, company limited by guarantee. Can't we create a community benefit society, use it to raise the money, and then pass the money down? Actually, that makes the chain of complexity and therefore the proposition to your investors um, very difficult. It also screws around with the tax reliefs and so for a number of reasons we're saying the community benefit society is the way to go. It's democratic. The asset lock means that any surplus has to be reinvested for mission. Um, shareholders can never make a profit on their shares so the shares never um, trade above notional value. So it is a social investment. The trick is, obviously, and they've found the key to this important works, you're aligning the right kind of money to your project. It's money that wants to do what you want it to do. Um, and, and, and that's the key to it actually being, in my view, good money. Because so often money wants you to do something other than you actually want to do. So this is a mechanism to allow you to align the right kind of money to your project. Um, I've commissioned Anthony Collins, Quaker citizen, uh, uh, solicitors in um, uh, Birmingham, to produce a guide on how to convert from one legal form to a community benefit society. Um, they're late with it, actually. <laughs> it's due, but they've been busy on other things. Um, I'm hoping it will be ready by the end of May. Um, all the access, I wasn't very good at logos and things. Um, Community Shares Unit has a big website with masses of resources. And MicroGenius is the crowdfunding platform, again with a website, where you can look at live deals. Um, the Pink Lane Jazz Club in Newcastle has just closed successfully having raised 125000 to buy a pub that they want to use as a jazz venue. Good morning. I was very interested in your comments about the 30% tax relief on the money that's lent or given to these funds. And you tell me it's not a charitable recognised organisation. I presume this 30% tax relief is classed by the revenue as a charitable donation in that year's tax? No. Um, <clears throat> the, there are a number of different tax reliefs to encourage people to invest in new businesses. So if you buy, at, if you put at risk money, so if you invest in shares, you buy equity in new start companies. 
commercial companies or community benefit societies. Um, as long as those organizations are doing qualifying trades, some things are excluded. So pure property development is excluded. Um, but if you are redeveloping a building like this to use as a cultural venue, then that's not deemed to be pure property and it becomes eligible for this tax relief. There are three important tax reliefs. One is called Special Enterprise Investment Scheme, and that actually is a 50% tax relief on any eligible investment, but it only covers the first £150,000 of any share issue. After that, there's the Enterprise Investment Scheme relief that goes up to £5 million. So for most startups, that covers all their startup capital. Um, and that's at 30%. And then in the last budget, this government introduced something called social investment tax relief. It's very untried and tested at the moment, but that is for unsecured lending to social enterprises who are starting up. So these are different to gift aid tax reliefs, and they relate to investments, not donations. Um, but they're much more substantial, obviously, than, than gift aid relief. Hi there. I just wanted to ask what you think the um, process is really about thinking whether or not this is a, an appropriate route for a given project to go down. It, it struck me that you know, many of the ones that you've talked about, brilliant projects, but one of the things that they had was was at least a potential for really strong community buy-in, something iconic like Hastings Pier or indeed the Portland Works. That might not be so with with every project. Is there a kind of, in terms of groups not finding themselves going down a kind of dead end of expending a lot of effort and then failing, how do you feel you you kind of options assess it before before committing to that to this route? We talk about a number of phases, but the first one is to ask the community if they are interested. And to the extent that <clears throat> in, in the 21st century, this can be a global community, um, there may be enough people locally, there may be enough people globally who actually are interested in the same thing that you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I think there are two levels of interest, particularly around heritage projects. So there will be some people who are into the building um, for its own sake. They, they like the architecture, they like the design, they think that it fits in well with the townscape, whatever. They're into the building. And then there are other people who are into what the building's going to be used for. And again, in the Portland Works, uh, Works example, you know, you saw those two categories of people. It's a good, it's a, it's a wonderful building. It has a fantastic history. It's part of Sheffield's culture and heritage. But then there are other people who actually love the fact that it's still being used for metal bashing and for crafts, trades, and that kind of thing. I think the um, thing that really made a difference was we had this planning campaign to start with and uh, we use social media and um, I know people are still wary of social media but it can start to get even if you know you as a young person might see the the messages on Facebook but you tell your family so the rest of the family does get to know about it but it does spread the words it spreads it very cheaply yeah, so actually campaigning historically used to be quite expensive. You'd have to get all your leaflets printed. You'd have to persuade people to get out and about to hand out leaflets. Now you can get the word out. And um, the idea, if you follow with the leaflets, if you start with a social media campaign, you've already raised awareness, like a, set up some little logo that people recognize. Um, get that out and then take your leaflets, follow it with those. Because I think the, the leaf, people will then recognize who you are and start to read more about it in the press and leaflets and what else, whatever else you do. Did you find that there were people who were former residents of Sheffield who were interested in being investors? 
there, um, we actually, I've looked through it, something like about 75% of the people that have invested, their postcode is within 10 miles of Portland Works. But there are also people that live in London, um, and um, I think we've got a couple that actually live abroad. But when you, um, they've been spoken to by somebody um, within the project, and they come from Sheffield, or their granny comes from Sheffield, or their granny used to work as a buffer girl. You know, it, there's, there's a personal, um, visceral connection to what's going on, and they care about it. But they won't hear about, if they're in Australia, they won't hear about it if you're handing out leaflets on the high street. So it's, it's really worthwhile doing, and it's cheap. <laughs> Yes. That really make it essentially successful. That's great. And I think all these projects should start with uh, building the building of the to appear by the Facebook group. There was a fire that actually was going to take control of the local council. They lobbied all three candidates uh, in the by action and got them all to say, um, I believe that the people to appear. So, um, Kate Wells is here, is a media specialist and I think has done a fantastic job for Bradford One. So if you wanted to look at a model website, there's a, I love it, there's an animation to recruit members that I think is just great. So um, there are ways of doing this, so it, it's a multimedia campaign and actually nothing beats word of mouth. Um, but, you know, you get the first 10 and then you say, go and get 10 more. Um, and if you can build that passion, actually, that's fundamental to the project.